My mentor, Sister Virginia Brinks, used to say, Students often don't realize that they are their own best teacher. Welcome to the A&P Professor, a few minutes to focus on teaching human anatomy and physiology with host Kevin Patton. In this episode, I discuss a summer neuroscience workshop. I discuss ganglion cells in the retina. And I talk about some ways we can make dissection activities a lot more efficient. I want to tell you about a neuroscience workshop that's coming up in the summer of 2019. Specifically, it's a one-week workshop in July, from July 14th through the 20th. And it's at the University of Missouri in Columbia, otherwise known as Mizzou, which is in the heart of the state of Missouri. And it's funded by the National Science Foundation. This is, I think, the 13th offering of this workshop. And I went to the first or second one, and I really enjoyed it. And one of the unique things about it is it's offered by a team made up of engineering professors and biology professors. So you get to take kind of an engineering look at how neurons and action potentials are modeled and and neural pathways are modeled. It sounds complicated, but it's really very interesting. And it's targeted to undergraduate faculty from the biological sciences, from psychology, physics, math, engineering, anyone who has an interest in teaching and learning more about neuroscience. One of the other great aspects of it, besides it just being a great workshop, is that it's funded by the National Science Foundation. And that not only covers the workshop itself, but there's funding available for lodging and for meals. And depending on what the expenses are, there may be some grant money available for travel as well. The downside is there's only room for 10 participants, so you got to get in there early. So I have a link in the show notes and at the episode page at the APProfessor.org to more details if you're interested. And even if you can't make it this year, or you're listening to this episode after it's too late, by the way, the deadline for applying is February 15th. So if it's after that time, or just doesn't work out for July of 2019, hopefully they'll be doing this again in future years. So you're going to want to get on their mailing list and tell them that Kevin Patton sent you. Maybe that'll, (laughs) I don't know if that'll get you moved up or moved down on the list, but you can try it and see. Anyway, if you're listening to this on the app, I'll have a PDF on the app, so that might be a little handier than uh, going to the the link that I'm going to give you. So I hope uh, some of you go, and if any of my listeners go, please do report back on the podcast hotline what you learned and what you gained from it. You may have heard some news recently about some breakthroughs that have been made in understanding specialized cells in the eye that link to the mood regions in the brain, especially those connected to what is sometimes called seasonal affective disorder or winter depression. And it turns out that that's really just the latest step we've made in progress that has been going on actually for decades. And it relates to sort of a a second kind of vision besides the vision that forms images that we normally think of when we think of vision. There is a second kind of vision which doesn't form images but instead is detecting changes in daylight throughout the day. And that helps our circadian rhythms and our body clocks in general sort of synchronize to our environment and understand not only what time of day it is, but what time of a lunar month it is. 
and what time of the year it is, that what that is what season it is, by detecting changes in the amount of reflected sunlight available at night from the moon. So there's our lunar cycle. And the amount of direct day, daylight, direct sunlight that gets to us that changes in duration from one season to another. And maybe, you know, I'm actually recording this on the day of the uh, winter solstice, so that kind of plays into our awareness of this calendar, of this seasonality of daylight length. And so, um, you know, I I just kind of want to go back and maybe emphasize that it might be worth our while, at least in a two-semester A&P course where we have a little bit more time to dive a little more deeply into things, to really mention that role of the retinal cells that deal with that sort of vision. And I think all of us, no matter what level of A&P we're teaching at in an undergraduate course, I think we all cover rods and cones and what their general function is, even in a very cursory way that we just have to do to fit everything into an A&P course, right? But I wonder how many of us go into the ganglion cells. Now, you may recall that the ganglion cells are in the retina, and the light actually hits them before it hits the rods and cones. And they do receive input from the rods and cones, and for a long time were thought to be solely a part of that network of information that is coming from rods and cones and is eventually being relayed to the brain for further processing. But it turns out that at least some of those ganglion cells contain a visual pigment of their own, not the same visual pigment that is in the rods and cones, that is rhodopsin in the rods and uh, various forms of photopsin in the uh, cones, but it has melanopsin. And melanopsin is sensitive in a wide range of blue colors. And so that's why you often hear about, you know, uh, blue light imitating daylight so much. And, And when we're looking at screen devices, for example, during the time when our, our environment really should be dark, that is, without sunlight, if we're watching things that have bright blues of the right combination of blue wavelengths that can fool our ganglion cells, and therefore our brain into thinking that the sun is still out, that can really mess up our circadian rhythms. So there's all kinds of filters and even built-in software that can change it to a less blue light. It makes everything look kind of orangish when you start removing the blues, but a lot of people uh, really get a beneficial effect in terms of preserving their natural circadian and seasonal rhythms. And uh, some of this newer research is sort of a step in the right direction. And for quite a while, we've known that the ganglion cells are sending some of their information to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's a nucleus in the hypothalamus that is just above the optic chiasma. And, And then it's routed from there to the paraventricular nucleus, which is nearby also in the hypothalamus. And then there's all kinds of convoluted pathways that have been proposed, and some of them have actually been um, shown you know, to occur, maybe even going down into uh, the superior cervical ganglion and, and back up again. And sometimes it goes to the pineal body, and we're just now kind of working out where all of this goes. And we know the pineal body or pineal gland is going to be secreting melatonin in different levels as that blue light level changes throughout the day. And so some of it's been worked out, and but there's a lot more to work out. And there's a lot more to work out in terms of what the brain is actually doing with that information. So some of it we know about in terms of the release of melatonin. And as we work out all the different things melatonin might be doing throughout our body in terms of synchronizing our body clock mechanisms, we're also working out other places in the brain that might be processing that information. So that's kind of what's new. So even though we've known about a lot of this for a long time, it's only recently that we've started to really apply this in our our practical day-to-day living 
And now we can kind of give the anatomy and physiology behind that. And not only that, impart to our students that, hey, this is ongoing science. We still don't have it completely worked out. There might be some new wonderful things that we can learn that is going to make these daily practices even more effective in terms of preserving a natural and healthy kind of circadian rhythm in terms of at least the the light information that's coming into us. And I think it kind of blows students' minds a little bit when they understand that there's another kind of vision, uh, that we are detecting light for other reasons other than visualizing our surroundings. So that's kind of fun to, you know, weave into your course, even if you're not going to make your students responsible for that information, at least kind of, you know, there's some stories that we can weave in there that are going to help motivate our students and help them see the practical applications of what they're learning in their AMP course. This podcast is sponsored by HAPS, the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society, promoting excellence in the teaching of human anatomy and physiology for over 30 years. Go visit HAPS at theapprofessor.org slash HAPS. Over the years that I've been teaching anatomy and physiology, I've found that when I do a dissection activity, in the undergraduate AMP lab course, it can either be a real big mess that ends up being a waste of time for students where they're not really learning much of anything outside of what we could have otherwise learned in the lecture course. But it can also be a very focused activity that is not only interesting and motivating for students, It also helps them learn structures in a deeper, more thorough way. And a tool I've found that's very helpful in getting it to that latter form, that is a more focused kind of lab activity, is what I call a dissection list. You might have another name for it. It's really just kind of a a version of a generic lab list. That is, a list of all the structures that a student must identify in a dissection. And it will include all of the structures that a student must find and all of the structures that a student must be able to identify when they get to the lab practical test. And that could be different. I have had dissection activities where I've given them a list of structures to find, but then marked off only a subset of those that I know I want to test them on. So those are the ones they need to keep practicing, not just find it, but get to know it thoroughly. So really, it's sort of a form of a a set of learning outcomes. In other words, what you need to be able to do at the end is identify this list of structures. So that's our dissection list. And honestly, I thought everybody did this in AMP lab. Because when I first started teaching AMP all those many years ago, I was the second of two AMP professors hired at our college. The AMP teacher who had been there for many years before me had been teaching AMP for, I think, a little over 50 years. Or maybe it was a little less than 50 years. I don't know. Or maybe it was 150 years. (laughs) I just remember thinking she was really old. Of course, I was really young at the time. So, of course, I thought she was really old. But she was pretty old. But she was also very wise. And one of the first things she did in mentoring me was to hand me her lists of dissections. She'd say, here's the sheep brain dissection. Here's the sheep heart dissection list. This is what I use. You can use it or you can adapt it. But here it is. She was a great mentor. I learned so much from her. And I just thought, well, that's the way everybody does it. And I do know that a lot of people do it. Maybe a lot of you listening use a dissection list. But over time, as I've interacted with more and more other AMP teachers, I've discovered that Many AMP teachers do not use a lab list of any kind, and certainly not a dissection list. But even if you're one of those that does use a dissection list, listen along for two reasons. One is, there may be something 
that strikes you in my description of this of and how it's used that might help you make your list work better. Or something might strike you that, hey, he didn't cover this, and I found this aspect of a dissection list to be really useful. Well, great, then you can call in and share it with the rest of us so we can all learn from what you've found. So let's get into it. Let's look at the list itself. There's all kinds of formats and options in terms of how you put together the list. It can be literally just a list format. Maybe, you know, bullet points. Maybe organized in a way where you'll have like sections and then indented bullet points under that. So let's say one region of the brain and then bullet points under that. Another region of the brain, bullet points under that. And by the way, before I get any further, I am referring to the sections of small specimens, not of the whole human body that's going to take the entire semester to do. Although this can be adapted for that kind of use too, I'm talking more about discrete single organ dissections like a sheep brain, a sheep heart, a spinal cord, um, an eye, a mammalian eye, or something like that. So it could be a bulleted list, as I mentioned. I've also seen people do lab lists in a table format. So it's still kind of a list, but it's not strictly a list. It's a list in the form of a table. And I'm sure that there are other kinds of formats that work, but those are the two, either the traditional list or a list in the form of a table that I've seen used. So one of the things that you might want to put in the list is for each structure that is listed there, each structure that a student must be able to identify, I might also somehow indicate there, either as a different column in a table or as maybe a little symbol with a footnote or a parenthetic remark, which specimen the student must be able to identify it on. Now, sometimes we use more than one specimen, like I might have a slices from a human brain, or we might have an actual human brain that students can look at along with working on their own individual sheep brain. So I might mark on the list, well, which of these structures do you need to be able to identify in the human specimen, and which do you need to be able to identify in the sheep brain specimen? Or maybe it's not a dissection specimen that goes along with, let's say, the sheep brain. Maybe it's a model of a human brain or a chart of the human brain. Or maybe I want them to be able to identify it in photographs. I want to tell my students ahead of time that sort of thing, like how are they going to be tested? When they get to the lab practical, is it just going to be sheep brains? Or are they going to have to be able to pick things out on a model, on a chart? Is it all going to be sheep brains? Or am I going to have human brains in those charts and models and so on? Another thing I might want to mark on there, if it makes a difference, is what is the view that the student needs to be looking at the structure when they are going to be tested on that dissection? So, for example, in the sheep brain, I might list a particular structure and I might mark that they need to be able to identify it in a mid-sagittal section or maybe a mid-sagittal section and in a frontal section. Or is it in an internal uh, aspect or an external aspect of a structure? So you want to think through those things because if students are studying it one way, not realizing there's another view, there's another angle at which they could get to a structure, they might not be well prepared. And our goal is not to try and trick students, right? Our goal is to try and set them up for success so that they really are very thorough in their studying and in their practicing. Another option for that lab list, for that dissection list, and I love this option, a lot of people don't think to do this, is don't just put bullet points, use check boxes, tick boxes, so that the student can tick off or check off what they found as they find them. I've also toyed around with having two columns of check boxes. One is, did you find it? And the next one is, do you feel fairly confident about it? That you're really certain that you can find it again? 
And so it kind of forces them to not only make sure they've found everything because they're checking it off. And you, as you're walking around the room and helping them, you can check their checklist and see, well, have you found, you know, a lot of these? Are there missing things that haven't been checked? And maybe keep an eye out for people just kind of boom, 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 going through checking off things (laughs) without even looking at their specimen. So it does help them keep track. But by having that second column or that second set of check boxes, it also, you know, at least it's our attempt to to kind of push them into stopping for a second and thinking it through. Do I really know this or am I going to leave that unchecked for later? So it's sort of a, a, a certain confidence level. Of course, they will not have mastered it completely because they're going to have to come back to that multiple times with some space in between before they really have it mastered. So they're going to have to do some studying outside of lab. But there is a certain level of confidence that they can get to within the lab. Or maybe you can tell them, well, just don't check that second column off while you're here. Don't do that until later in your study when you really feel like you've mastered it. I've also seen dissection lists that leave a little space for notes. So students can take some notes right on that list. So that now it becomes not just a tool for guiding them for what their learning outcomes are, but it's also a tool for them to take notes for themselves. And I've also heard of people leaving spaces for little sketches in there, like you might do maybe um, sketches. Sometimes you'll see this in lab manuals for in the lab report for um, histology or some other microscopic exploration, where there'll be like little circles or little squares where the students are asked to sketch out what they see under the microscope. Well, you can do that in dissections too, where they sketch out the um, the the different regions of the sheep brain, for example, and so on individually there. Now, that can get kind of big and unwieldy for a, a list. So, you know, you can take it or leave it, see what works best for your style of teaching and the style of learning that your students are using, but it's a thought. Uh, you might also want to include maybe special notes or annotations with the different structures in the list. For example, you might want to make a note that this may not be present in your specimen. Because like for sheep brains, depending on on how they're prepared, how they're taken from the sheep, for example, you may not see many, if any, of the stubs left from the cranial nerves. You might not see the um, hypothesis. You might not see, uh, you know, any one of a number of different structures. So you might want to make note of that on the list, like, well, yeah, here's the master list, but here's some things that you might not see in your specimen. Or you might have to look around to several specimens to find one where this this actually exists, because they're not always easy to find. Or you might make a notation, like, you might want to ask for help with this one. Call me over when it's time to look for this one, because this one's tricky. Or you might make a want to make a note with a structure that says, This one is only visible after you've moved this other structure out of the way or after you lift it up out of the way or push it out of the way or whatever. Another thing about these dissection lists that's very important is they need to be organized logically. It's only minimally helpful if you're listing the structures alphabetically because then as students progress in a logical way through their dissection, looking at one region, then another, then another of the specimen, they're going to be hunting all over the place. But if you group things logically, not only is going, that going to help them find the structures on the list as they're doing the dissection, it's also going to provide a graphic organizer for students to begin to build their conceptual framework of what this whole big set of structures is. It helps them see how different structures are related to one another by organizing your list in a logical manner. That is, an anatomically logical manner. Since we're on the topic of organization, I also want to strongly encourage you to check it again, and then put it away, and then check it again before you use it, Because we want to have perfect spelling and perfect formatting of terms so that students are learning the exact correct terminology. 
I see a lot of lab lists that have a lot of typos, a lot of just plain old spelling errors in it, a lot of formatting errors where things are improperly capitalized. And that's not helping our students because they're not learning professional communications when we do that. Not only that, there are some students who really have a hard time with just the language, not just the English language, but just reading in general. For example, students that uh, have dyslexia or some similar issue with the way they read language and so on, and things like typos, improperly formatted terms and so on, can really confuse them. Now, that doesn't normally confuse me, at least not usually, because I can kind of see through that. But then again, I don't deal with dyslexia. So for me, that's not a big deal. But there are a lot of students who have those kinds of issues. And again, we don't want to mess them up. Besides that, we want to be a good model for professional communication. Now, some of the benefits of using this list are, and and I think this is the biggest one, is when we use a dissection list that says, here is what you need to know, exactly, here is what you need to know for the lab practical, then we are being as clear as clear can be on what they need to know. And isn't that really helpful to students when we're as clear as we can possibly be to let them know this is it. This is the beginning and end of what you need to know. Even if what we put on our list is just a listing of all the boldface terms in our lab manual or atlas or handout or whatever we're using, if you just tell them, well, you need to know all the boldface terms that are in the lab manual, in this section of the lab manual, okay, that might work okay. But a lot of students, uh, they're not really going to, it's not going to pop out to them and they're going to miss some. Remember, there are some students that might not be able to really see the bold face type as boldly as you're seeing it. But besides that, it's just kind of messy. And I think by taking the information, yes, they already have it in one form. And yes, they ought to be able to translate that into their own list. Well, you know, sometimes just giving them the list makes it more concrete for them, and it's more of a guidance for them, and it's more helpful to them. That being said, if there is time available, or you want to take this approach for whatever reason, maybe you could make a pre-lab assignment to be, you make your own list of all the boldface terms. And then we'll check each other's lists when we come into lab to make sure that none are missing. But, you know, there is always that danger of something being missing and a student not studying what they need to study for the test. And maybe that's on us when that happens, if we haven't really ensured that they have the correct and complete list. Another advantage of using a dissection list is it gives them a tool to use during the dissection. That is, it becomes one of their dissection tools, and it allows them to progress in an orderly way because, remember, they're checking it off. Okay, I know I've found this, I've now I've found this one, now I've found this one, and so on. And so it's a, a tool to keep progress. And it also helps you. It's a tool for you as the teacher to see how they're progressing because you can't keep your eyes on each student all the time to see if they're really doing everything, if they're really progressing. And so that becomes a tool to kind of help fill in the blanks as you move from student to student or lab group to lab group and so on to, you know, if they have the, you know, have them have their dissection lists out and, and look at how they're checking it off and ask them questions about that. Did you really find all of those, you know, already this quickly? Or are you just checking things off? And, you know, not in an accusatory way, but in a way that's kind of saying, you know, I know how this game is played and we don't want to play that game because you're not going to learn anything. Use your time now in lab and I'm going to help you do that. So let's sit down. Let's go through these. So it's a tool for you as the teacher. And I think another benefit is it supports their confidence level. It's sort of like having training wheels on the bike where they might not really absolutely need those training wheels, but It gives them a certain level of confidence so they can jump into it and really get moving without hesitating too much. And again, this was never a problem with me with dissection. I always just charged in there because 
I enjoyed it so much as a student. But, you know, some students are much more hesitant, either because of lack of confidence or in, in their abilities or in their lack of confidence in their comfort level with doing dissections, especially if they're new at dissection. So this is, this is a tool to kind of help them. It, it gives them a, a somewhat of a level of confidence to start off with. It's, it's a, a map that they have alongside them to help them along. So the question I have for you now is, have you used dissection lists like this before? And if so, what did you find useful? And maybe there was some problem that you ran into. What are those? I want to hear about that. We all want to hear about that. We want to hear about your ideas for the best use of dissection lists. Or if you have some ideas about why it's not a good idea to use a dissection list, we want to hear that too. A surgical transcript and a captioned audiogram of this episode are funded by AAA, the American Association of Anatomists, at anatomy.org. As I've said before, the dissection activity that we do in the undergraduate AMP lab course can either be a big, messy free for all where the students really aren't learning much. Or it can be a more focused activity where the students really are learning more deeply and more thoroughly and getting a better appreciation for the structures of a particular organ or of the whole body. And one of the ways that I've found that makes things go in that better path, that is the path of a focused activity where the time is really well spent, and the learning is very deep, is to do a pre-dissection activity, which is basically a low-tech virtual practice dissection that the students do before they do the real dissection. And the way I do that is sort of an application of a strategy that I mentioned just very briefly way back in episode 10, which was entitled Nine Super Strategies for Teaching the Skeleton, I mentioned that I might print out a skeleton or I might print out a set of bones and have students find the structures there before they actually get into the lab so that they've had a little bit of practice with it before they're looking for it on the skeleton so that their time is better spent in that limited lab time that they have with the specimens. And the same thing is true for dissections of like a sheep brain or a sheep heart or a mammalian eye or a spinal cord or any of the other many kinds of dissections that we might be doing in the undergraduate AMP lab. So, for example, let's use the sheep brain as an example. What I will do is give them a handout ahead of time that has photographs of the sheep brain on a sheet of paper. And sometimes I use that those really big sheets. They're like a double of a standard sheet of uh, copy paper. So they're the 11 by 17 rather than 8.5 by 11. But I've done this with the regular 8.5 by 11. And I printed it out in color. You know, I had our copy center do that. But I've also done it in black and white. And to be honest with you, I think the color looks prettier. I think it's really cool. But I think the black and white <laughs> works just as well, so why not use that? And you don't feel so bad for spending so much money on all that toner and so on. And sometimes, depending on the copy machine itself, on the color copies, the toner actually has kind of a waxy sheen, so it's kind of hard to, to write across, you know, to draw lines across it and so on. So what I do is I go online and I find copyright-free images of sheep brain cut in different ways. And there's lots of those because everybody in the world dissects sheep brains, and lots of students take pictures and post them. And, but you need to find some that you have permission to use. It might be in public domain or Creative Commons license or something like that. Or even better, what I'll do sometimes is just get my phone out and take some pictures of the sheep brain from different angles and maybe cut along different planes. And then I take those images and I put them in Microsoft Word and start arranging them on the page. And 
there are some formatting tools in there where I can actually remove the background very easily. So it's just the sheep brain specimen and not all the junk behind it or next to it. And I'll arrange those and I won't label them. And so I give that as a handout to the students and I tell them, before you come, you need to, you know, walk in the door here, having already gone through our lab directions for dissecting the sheep brain. And I want you to find this list of structures. So I give them their dissection list. This is your list of structures. And you need to find them and label them on this sheet. And depending on the specimen, there might be more than one sheet. I give them like maybe two or three pages of, let's say, the sheep brain cut on different angles and so on. And so they need to go find it there and label it. And I tell them that if they can't find it, they're really stuck, then write the name on the sheet and just put a question mark by it so that I know that you've looked for it. So when they come in, I start, you know, and they start getting their, their materials together and getting organized, I start walking around and say, well, do you have your, your practice dissection? And have them get it out. And if they don't have it, we can have a talk about that, why that's important that they needed to have had that. And if they do have it, then I go through it and say, well, you know, you only found five things here, but I have 25 things or 55 things or whatever on your dissection list. You know, what's, uh, let's talk about that. And so that's a good teaching moment. It's a good coaching moment when those kinds of things happen. And they will, and they do happen. And then, of course, the next time you do a dissection, they're much more likely to have it done because they know you're going to have a little coaching session with them <laughs> if they don't have it done. And what I've found is the students feel a lot more confident when they come in. They feel like they know what they're looking for. Whereas before I started doing that, the students would often just express to me bluntly and say, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. I don't know what I'm supposed to be seeing. I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. But if they've done it in a practice mode, in this very low-tech practice mode, where what they've done is labeled photographs of dissected specimens, then they, have, they know what they're looking for. And then when they see it in 3D, I think they're going to appreciate the dissection experience that much more because it's going, to, it's going to pop out. It's no longer 2D, it's now 3D. And they can move it around and they can, can identify textures and they can bend things around or poke through them or cut through them and so on and look at different things than they were able to do with just the photograph. So try it. And see if it works. It has worked really well for me. If you have some ideas on how to make it better or some alternate ways of doing that or of some other activity that this reminds you of that you want to share with other listeners of this podcast, please contact me on the podcast hotline or by email or Twitter or whatever. The a and Professor is hosted by Kevin Patton, professor, blogger, and textbook author in human anatomy and physiology. This episode is dedicated to the memory of Sister Virginia Brinks, who mentored me as her apprentice in teaching a and for five exhilarating years. <laughs>